We're continuing our sampling of the teachings of Jesus. In our last presentation, we looked at the parables of the kingdom in Matthew 13. And of course, before that, we looked at the Sermon on the Mount. In this lesson, we'll take just two samples from the Gospel of Luke. And then in the next uh, session, we'll look at one long sermon in the Gospel of John. The teachings of Jesus from the book of Luke that we'll concentrate on are very familiar stories that Jesus told. We want to look at them in context. We want to make sure we know the, the meaning. In Luke chapter 10, we'll read the story of the Good Samaritan. And in Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal son and two associated stories about a lost sheep and a lost coin. How little we're able to cover in our limited time. The Gospels offer so many more lessons. We're covering in Luke just these two sermons, these two lessons. There's so much more to learn. Just as an example uh, to encourage you in your future further study of the Gospels. In uh, his book, The Way According to Luke, Paul Borgman has included this fascinating chart about lessons that are repeated in the beginning and the end of the Gospel of Luke. Notice, for example, that the first lesson that he presents is from chapters 9 and 10 uh, on the theme of peace to this house, which he parallels to a passage in the nearer the end of the book in chapters 18 and 19 about the things that make for peace. Then more strikingly similar, as he numbers it 2a, in chapter 10, you read about what must I do to inherit eternal life, and then again, you see at the bottom to B, in chapter 18, again, you look at what must I do to inherit eternal life. And if you'll notice, there is a sequence, kind of comes to a point in chapter 13 on uh, what to do to be saved, and moves back covering very much similar topics in reverse order. I just present that uh, chart to you to bring to your attention how much more there is to study. We're just going to cover Luke 10 and Luke 15. You know the story of the Good Samaritan. Remember, to place it in context, we start out not with the story, but with a conversation that Jesus has with an expert on Jewish law. So we pick up reading in Luke chapter 10, verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So this is a person that's an expert on the law of Moses. He doesn't know if he trusts Jesus to be a good teacher, so he asks him, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replies with a question. What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he, that is the expert in Jewish law, answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he, Jesus, said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So pick up these points for the context of the story of the Good Samaritan. The exchange starts off with the two agreeing on the most essential and important elements of the law, to completely love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus commends 
this man for giving the right answer. But he puts in a little bit of a challenge when he says, do this and you will live, implying perhaps that the legal expert uh, was not doing this. That seems to be implied by the uh, question that he asked of Jesus, perhaps as a rhetorical question, uh, hoping to draw attention away to, uh, to his uh, perhaps guilt of neglect. And he asked him, who is my neighbor? That's when Jesus tells about the Good Samaritan. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Understand it's a rugged trail to walk down uh, a steep uh, hill from uh, Jerusalem down to Jericho. And it's likely that this unnamed, unidentified man uh, was in a very remote area and subject to mistreatment by these um, villains, who uh, these robbers, who not only robbed him, but stripped him and beat him and left him half dead. Picking up then in verse 31 through 33, there's going to be a clear contrast here. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. The priest and the Levite occupy exalted positions in Jewish society. They are the ones who can work at the temple, the only ones who can work inside the temple. They are seen as an epitome of, of pious uh, Jewish religion. But Jesus exposes that sometimes those in public positions assumed to be pious can have hard hearts. So not one, but two people in such positions see a beat up dying man on the side of the road and just step aside not to have to get near him. In contrast, a Samaritan walks by. You're familiar already with the tension between Jews and Samaritans. They had a bad history, and Jews looked down on Samaritans. Jesus is making an obvious point when he speaks of a Samaritan taking pity on the man. Here's what he does, verse 33. The Samaritan came to where he was, saw him, had compassion, Having compassion is evidently something that the priest and the Levite did not do. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him. Whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. He did all that he could do and more than might be expected. So Jesus takes that story and turns it back on the person who is trying to justify himself by saying, who is my neighbor? After telling the story, Jesus says, according to verse 36, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. 
with that beautiful story, Jesus is somewhat putting in his place or improving the understanding of someone who knew what was most important to God. At least he knew what the scripture was, but evidently needed to put into practice what he knew was right about neighborly love. Moving on to Luke chapter 15. These are some of the most familiar passages in Luke, and I'm, I'm sure that you uh, are quite familiar with them. Again, Jesus is dealing with people who've come to challenge him, to uh, try and perhaps make him look bad. Uh, chapter 15 in the first couple of verses is the situation which leads to telling these stories. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So the Pharisees, the strictest um, denomination of Jews of the day, and the scribes, those who meticulously kept the records, are complaining about Jesus. They are um, appalled that he would spend his time with bad people. He even would share meals with them. Jesus responds with three stories. Beginning in chapter 15, verse 3. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, doesn't leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. So without directly answering their criticism of his spending time and socializing with sinners, he tells them in a way that they can't miss the point unless they want to miss the point. That it's more important when one is lost, when a sinner is lost, to go to the lost one than it is to close yourself in with however many there are who are saved. He tells a similar story in verses 8 through 10. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the coin that I'd lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. We've all dropped something valuable. I remember once doing yard work, and I didn't know it, but I dropped my wedding ring. It had fallen off into a bag of old leaves. In the middle of the night, I woke up and realized I didn't have my wedding ring on. And, I, and as soon as it was daylight, I went out and I went, you know, leaf by leaf through the, through the uh, garbage bag until I found my wedding ring. And I was so delighted, so relieved. I was like the woman who had found her silver coin. 
when Jesus, again, clearly states that he's talking about the importance of finding sinners and bringing spiritual joy in getting one sinner to repent. Beginning in verse 11, Jesus tells a longer and more touching story known as the parable of the prodigal son. Uh, most people know the word, but don't know the meaning of the word. He's called the prodigal son traditionally because he is, um, uh, he wastes his inheritance. So let's um, start with what the young man does wrong. Beginning in verse 11, Andy said, there was a man who had two sons and the younger of them said to his father, give me the share of the property that's coming to me. And he divided up his property between them. So this young man is uh, intent enough on moving on that he wants his inheritance before his father dies. And the father goes ahead and makes a proper apportionment between the two brothers. So it says, not many days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and took a journey into a far country, and he squandered his property in reckless living. That's the prodigal part. He uh, spent his money uh, with abandon. Verse 14 says, and when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country. And he began to be in need. He'd spent all his money and everything was expensive now because there was a famine. So he went out and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the field to feed pigs. If you're a city person like I am, you might not particularly see that as a pleasant job. You might not want to go feed pigs. You might really need the money before you take that job. Add to that, that pigs were unclean animals to Jews. And those hearing this story would have thought that to be a really degrading job that the man had to take, the young man. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate and nobody gave him anything. So he's been brought down by his own wasteful, reckless spending and wild living. The story takes a turn in verse 17, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. And I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven. And before you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. If I'm reading it right, he's really been humbled. He knows that he's a, a, a bad reflection on his family. He knows that what he's done is sinful before God. But he also knows that he doesn't have to live as low as he's living, that his father is, is good enough to his servants that they at least have enough to eat. And he thinks, I could at least go be a servant in my father's house, even though I know he might be ashamed of me and I might not get the privileges I had before. And then one of the beautiful parts of the story, verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran, embraced and kissed him. So the son starts on his speech. Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. 
I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father doesn't even let him finish the speech. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. There's something in us that would like to just stop at that point in the story because it is so beautiful. That's not the end of the story and it's really not the point of the story. It's the good side, it is about the compassionate father. But the story goes on to talk about the attitude of the older brother, beginning in verse 25. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came up and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But look at the reaction of the older brother. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you, I've never disobeyed your command. You never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Perhaps Jesus didn't even need to explain the point by now. It's so clear that the critics of Jesus lack compassion for sinners. They might rejoice over a found lamb or a found coin. But to really get to their hearts, Jesus goes on to teach them about the found son, the son who had been prodigal, the son whom the father lavishly welcomes home. But also a story about the obedient, loyal son with a bad attitude. Lo, these many, have I, many years have I slaved and obeyed you, but you never gave me a party. He even adds details that we don't even know if they're true. Maybe they are, but he accuses his brother, whom he doesn't even call his brother. He says, this son of yours has been out there with prostitutes. Whether the older brother is correct or not about the facts. He's not correct in his heart. And the father corrects that son. And he explains that the party was for the return of the young son who had lived sinfully. That the loyal son has everything. And he ends 
with lines that are repeated twice in the story. He was dead and he's alive. He was lost, but now is found. What a beautiful expression of the heart that the gospel calls us to have towards those who've wandered away. We have...